God bless them. God bless them. This is the movie set for Medal of Honor Airborne. In Airborne, cinematics are all about keeping the player immersed in the game universe. I guess the Navy gets credit for that kill, huh? This is Private Rossum and Corporal Town, and their story begins here, the mission script, which is the jump point for the storyboarding process, where the cinematics start to come to life. The story unfolds in the actual gameplay space, which is co-inhabited by the player, the AI, and the cinematic characters. The space is designed with cover placement, navigation paths, and player and camera positioning. For believable character performances, Private Rossum and Corporal yeah. Town were motion captured at EA's Reality Capture Studio. The body and the facial motion data is processed and visualized in Maya, while the environments, lighting, and visual and audio effects are all integrated in the Unreal Editor. In Medal of Honor Airborne, you don't fade to black before playing a cinematic. You, the player, stay in the game from airdrop to victory. Wait, we're going down there? Into the trenches? Of course we are! When I first heard about making a game about uh, Airborne, I honestly thought there's no way this is ever going to work. Um, and, then, and then we started to uh, really look into the idea of what it meant to jump out of an airplane um, and, and kind of through a lot of prototyping, a lot of, uh, you know, working in, in the editor, various editors, um, we kind of came upon the, the solution that, hey, you know what, starting anywhere in an FPS is, is something that has never been done before. So I think this is something that everybody who's been designing mobile games and playing mobile games for the last couple of years is, I think, in a natural progression, has gotten to the point where the game has gotten so refined and so almost like a, a theme park ride where everyone had the same experience. It, it no longer became a game. The most important thing for me is, is as a player, is reading the encounter from above. You know, it, it's very overwhelming when, when you get pushed out of the plane or when you jump out of the plane and you look down and you see this entire level beneath you and, and you say, where do I go? As we started prototyping different forms of drop zones, and uh, we started with uh, little pocket encounters that were scattered around a map. You can't have a completely open space and expect the player to, to have fun. When you landed in a dead spot, you found yourself hiking a ways to, to get somewhere. So that evolved into a, um, a more hub and sector form of level design that uh, it's, it's very apparent to the player when he's in the parachute coming down. You can look around the map and you can see distinct zones and areas and battle lines. And from there, you can make educated choices about how you want to land and how you want to engage. As a gamer, you know, we want the, the game to tell us where we're supposed to go, but we also want the freedom to go wherever we want. So um, we realized from early on that we had to read the map from above. We had to be able to see where the safe areas were. You can see the battles, you can see the explosions, you can see the tracers on the way down. So if you look from your parachute, you can see strong, sectored engagements throughout the map, and you're like, okay, I'm not gonna land in the middle of this because I'm just not in the mood to deal with that right now, and I'm gonna land up on this high pedestal and pick off enemies from that point because I can see that high pedestal is there, I can see it's near a good fight, and I can take advantage of that. And that's what we do, so the map should read. The first time we actually started landing on rooftops and, and, and taking out guys from above and really using the verticality of the space, that's when I was like, okay, you know, we're, we kind of hit upon something here. This is, this is going to be uh, something special, something, something fun to, to work on. Um, and, uh, you know, as soon as we got to that point, it was like, okay, let, let's make this great. You know, I think we talked originally like, well, we'll put little wind zone volumes or whatever all over all the roofs and we can't let the player land on everything. We realized, you know what, it's open. The player's going to land on everything, and we just need to contain him in the entire battle zone. But inside there, everything's game, right? On your way down, you know, as you, as you get faster, as you're going down, it gets more and more difficult to, to find that, you know, pinpoint spot to hit. The important thing and the real task for the designer here is to provide a lot of meaningful places for the player to land all around the environment, and then hopefully there's enough authoring in the environment, enough interest in the environment that the player will come up with his own interesting landing positions and own, own, his own interesting sort of assaults on certain attacks. The drop allows the player to, to do a lot of things that, that in replay, it's, it's just going to be a lot of fun.
I don't think we fully appreciated what impact the drop was going to have. So once we sorted that out, once we realized that we needed to have these open environments that we could move around in, we could start standing up technology to solve that problem. We sort of had this uh, legacy AI system from older games in place, which um, seemed like you know it could handle lots of different situations. But as it turns out, we started to trying to do these you know dynamic open world encounters. It became apparent really early on that we needed some sort of um, system to handle all these different entry points into our encounters. So that's really when it started. And affordance basically is a, it's an attractive place to be when you're getting shot at or if you have to shoot at someone else. Um, in a combat space, it's, it's cover, it could be a tree, it could be a bunker. Uh, it's basically just where you want to put yourself in order to give yourself an advantage over your enemy. So we had to throw out all of our bags of tricks. We couldn't use triggers, couldn't use monster closets, because we didn't know where the player was going to come from. So instead, we just encode this information in the environment so the AI knows what cover is good, where to position themselves, the player attacks from a particular direction. Then the designers just got used to throwing AI in and seeing what they could do. Not only now um, are they, you know, knowing where to defend, they also know how to attack. They also know how to flank. They know how, you know, all these things that are, are built into the volumes, built into the um, environment now that they have access to. On a moment-to-moment -moment basis, they're always trying to find somewhere that they can be safe and, and somewhere that they could potentially pop out and shoot at their enemy. The enemy NPCs, the enemy soldiers, uh, coordinate by uh, leveraging the affordances in the environment to try to flank or uh, put pressure on top of the player. By the same token though, if the player starts to succeed, he can push the axis back, cause the axis to retreat, again through affordances, falling back to better territory. This does two really cool things. One, it makes the player feel like a complete badass because he's just mowing down NPCs and claiming territory for his allies. And by the same token, having the allies advance leads the player through what otherwise would be a fairly open and confusing environment. More, more of the time is sort of front-loaded in planning your encounter and planning the uh, configuration of your affordance network so that the fight can play out the way that you want it, um, even if the player comes from all these different directions. So there's more planning and there's, there's more initial setup involved. But after that, you kind of, you know, you don't want to do the fine-tuning because you want it to play differently every time. Well, we pulled off a lot of really cool environments for a first-person shooter in this game with this technology. We had narrow interiors and corridors exterior vertical spaces. I don't think we've even scratched the surface of what this thing is capable of. I can't wait to see what we pull off in the future. Anthony Schmill had found a picture of this, this monumental gothic looking shape and we, were, and we didn't know what it was and so when we did more research on it we realized Oh my God! This is like this is a, a lasting, real uh, Nazi building that's that's uh, um, that we could use in the game. It represented the pinnacle of our, our vertical gameplay that we were trying to get. The one we have the one we have in the game's got these giant twin 128 uh, cannons on the top. Four of them. Um, it's just got a crane on the top to move the barrels and change the barrels out. And underneath that, there's this whole ring, uh, another defensive layer of these flat guns. Just it's it, this was an amazingly uh, you wanted to avoid this if you're flying over the top of this because it would wipe you out. One of the key things on this building you, you'll you'll see on the inside is this thing was really like this giant auto cannon where it's got these these giant conveyors that move these bullets there. These these huge bullets up and towards the top to, to refeed these guns that are automatically firing. We, we tried to take this kind of holistic approach. It's almost like this cement Nazi giant really up there in the top. Of it, so it's this living, breathing thing. So the top of it, we, we looked very much as a functional defense mechanism where, where it was firing, you know, it, anything that gets in the vicinity, it will take out. But inside of that is kind of the heartbeat of the thing where, where you would have the, uh, again, the munitions feeding up into the defensive mechanism. You would have the uh, uh, water and power. You literally have generators in there. You would have, uh, it's almost like a little in city built inside a concrete, uh, giant concrete structure. The top is, is basically uh, houses the uh, the main the main weapons the twin 128s and um, the uh, the shells for those weapons and uh, that that was the main defensive area and you have two layers on the top of that when you get down a little bit deeper we were thinking of that being more of the, the brains of the thing um, where you'll see a little more of a, a uh, an orchestration of how they how they basically got all the the guns fed the munitions that they had going there when you go down a little deeper you'll find that there's this this giant conveyor going on the, the central core of that this 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 wonderful hub that you see the, the, the motion 
the, the thing's all designed around supporting, making sure that the, that that gun doesn't jam. And that's that's what a lot of the central area, this large, large, uh, multi-tiered uh, section is about, is, is making sure that that gets there. The bottom, or the lower area near the ground floor, is more about bringing in munitions that they're going to move up to the top and storing them. When we get below that, you, you start getting into the waterworks area, and you get more into the generation and air filtration, which is uh, all, all important components to keeping this thing viable, living and breathing. One of the most surprising things about conducting a weapon shoot is how much planning is involved to actually carry it off. That probably spent as many days uh, deciding what the mic layouts were going to be, how much cable we were going to need, how to set it up, the, the recording equipment. Um, actually, as, as much time prepping for the event as we as we spent actually recording it. And it's an environment that's really difficult to kind of. Uh, uh, hear what it is you're capturing because weapons have such a dynamic range that when you record it and put on the headphones yeah I got something but you don't really know you got the goods until you get back to the studio and that's where having 30 different microphones spread out all around the weapon site is really your, your kind of insurance policy to make sure that you nailed it. In previous games generally a weapon would, would consist of just a gunshot that would then just get, get a little bit quieter based on the distance that, the, that you were from the shooter. For this game, it was really important that we create, uh, if you can think of like onion layers, that you're peeling them away. And so when you hear an NPC firing in our game, if he's very far away, you're hearing the, the distant uh, elements that we captured at the weapon shoot. As he's getting closer, we're starting to blend in the midfield elements. As he's getting really close, now you've got a third layer of the, of the near field with gun mech in it. And so it's the same gunshot, and we're not trying to artificially create the distance. We actually captured it in that way. But to do that, we needed a huge collection of microphones spread out over a great distance so that we could then go back to the studio, resynchronize all the elements, blend them together so that you would get this real seamless sense of distance from near to far. So to, to capture the near field elements for, the, for our weapons, we had mics actually on the shooter, lavalier mics that he would wear. We had mics very in close proximity to the gun that were just directly underneath it or directly to the side of the weapon within three feet. We had other mics, uh, again, pointed uh, very near field, maybe right over the weapon shooter at about 10 feet over his shoulder, and then continue to, to expand on that about uh, 40 feet downrange. We had uh, a stereo pair of mics. 150 feet, another set of mics, 400 feet, as well as a, a whole collection of microphones way out off into the sides to kind of pick up ambient gunshots that we could then mix in with our backgrounds.
morning. This is uh, C-47, actually flew in D-Day, and we are here in Hondo, Texas to capture the audio. It's about 7 a.m., we've got the mics laid out, batteries recording here. Just waiting for pilot and mechanic to get this thing going. This is a Douglas C-47A that was built in Oklahoma City. It flew Normandy, it flew Operation Market Garden, it flew the resupply mission in the Battle of the Bulge, and it flew the largest airborne operation in the Second World War, the Operation Varsity Jump across the Rhine River in March 1945. The purpose of today's operation is to collect audio reference on the C-47. Uh, this is probably the most combat experienced C-47 artifact from the Second World War and it's going to be a featured star in Medal of Honor Airborne. Now, Medal of Honor Airborne, the team that's supporting the game, has done something that nobody else can do, and that is they just took a hop in 096, one of the last few remaining airworthy C-47s in the world today. In fact, the most significant C-47 artifact of them all. Um, the Medal of Honor team got tons of video reference, and then importantly, great audio reference, digital audio reference that's going to really enhance Medal of Honor Airborne and make it the best looking and best sounding game of them all. 